DI for different. DI for dignified. DI for distinguished. And welcome everyone to our first episode of DITV. Code name Black Table Talk. We are the Delta Iota chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And my name is Jafari Wells. I'm a Spring 20 initiate of the Delta Iota chapter. My name is Jamar Sims, Spring 28th of the Delta Iota chapter. My name is Umar Sano, Spring 20, Live 5. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in. So first, we're going to start off with some recent news. We're going to talk about the election. President-elect Joe Biden has officially won by taking the states Georgia and Arizona. The electoral count is now 306 to 232. So how we feel about that, brothers? All praise be to God. <laughs> All praise be to God. Quite honestly, I'm just happy uh, former President Donald Trump is out of office. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he uh, he rocks my nerves a little bit. I'm happy that we finally got uh, Joe Biden in office. Mm. And although no matter, it would not matter electorally, uh, the recount that's happening right now in Georgia, the reason they're having the recount is because the two candidates were within 0.5 of each other mm -hmm. uh, of the votes. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump has been trying to send a bunch of legal cases to court that have all been getting thrown out. Ridiculous. You know, he, he's been telling us for months that he wouldn't concede if he lost. And now we're seeing that he's being a big baby about it. So that's 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 the first thing we wanted to talk about. So as as you know, black men, where do we feel like we what do we feel like we can do to pressure this administration to work within the best interest of us? I mean, he got our vote, so I feel like he should do something for us now. Um, you see, um, there's a video going around of Joe Biden supporting Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated specifically. So I assume like he's in partnership with us and wants to see us prosper in any form. Yeah, I'm hoping that the result of this election, you know, will result in tangible change in our communities. And we also must acknowledge that, although like this is a big you know, step for us moving forward as black people, that a lot of our change has to be on uh, you know, a community-based level as well. You know, we have to put some persistence and effort behind that prayer that you know, Joe Biden got to the office. So hopefully we see better things transpire. Definitely, definitely. I also want to shout out uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, she's in office. She's an AKA, shout out to her. We see you fam. We yep. see you special. White House invite coming soon. Just be prepared for that. Um, all fam, be on the lookout. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to support her and share love with her from from our chapter to to her and her administration. I hope she helps Joe Biden in the in the biggest efforts. And um, I'm I'm really sure she has our back in, in any interest that we may have in supporting this candidacy. I agree with you all, brothers. I'm sorry, brothers. Did you have something to say? No. All right. Uh, yeah, just briefly, you know, um, being a, you know, black woman, a sister of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated from the Alpha chapter, um, we would hope that, you know, Kamala Harris will have our best interest at heart as a black community. Um, but she also has to look out, you know, for herself, her, you know, South Asian community, because uh, uh, in addition to being the first black vice presidential candidate, she's the first... Um, woman and the first South Indian or Indian uh, to make it to a major party nomination. So that's a really great thing. Um, so as we have been talking about, we want to see tangible change and some things that we can do to push forward, and at least in my opinion, is you know petitioning our government to make sure that they're actually working in our best interest and giving them things that are substantive, giving them actual policy suggestions, um, as you know, Sean King has been doing a lot with his uh, activism and things of that nature. So you know, just as us individuals here sitting in this room, what are some things that you think we can improve on in the black, or that we can ask the, you know, the current administration to improve on in the black community, be it education, you know, financial freedom? What are some things we think that, that this presidential uh, administration can help us, um, you know, move forward? Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, well. We can come back to you, brother. Yeah, yeah please yeah, come back to me. I have... Well, I feel like yeah. I want I want to say at first before we make or um, enforce like things we want to see from them. I think from us we also have to enforce something from the black community. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of us aren't that educated when it comes to politics and policies in in our government, um, locally, uh, statewide, and nationally. Um, we have to educate ourselves furthermore. And that's how we can better improve ourselves and, and make others more accountable. Because if we're not accountable for ourselves, how can we be accountable for the presidency and what they do out there? Agreed. You know, <laughs> I'm really trying to think. Yeah, so um, what I was going to say, or at least what I was getting at in, a, in a, a little bit, is, you know, education, making education more affordable. 
we know, um, unfortunately, black people are disproportionately impoverished in this country. So if we make education more proportional, theoretically, we would be able to level the playing field when it comes to access to quality jobs. Um, so that's one way. Uh, second is the increase in minimum wage. A part mm. of the reason we're impoverished is because we're not making wages for the amount of products that we produce. So we can get something done with minimum wage. That'd be a great um, you know, change. And I think one of the biggest things is if not the biggest reparations, you know, can we finally, you know, get around Oof. to talk about reparations? You know, we've been here for over 400 plus years, you know, dealing with the same oppression that we've been dealing with all of this time, um, dealing with the same police violence and state sanction, you know, disrupting of communities that we've been dealing with for such a long time. So if we could finally get uh, a president and vice president to talk about reparations. I think it should be, you know, the administration that has the vice president of the first black president and the president of the first black vice president. So I think that's something that we could talk about. So moving a little bit forward, unless the brothers have anything else to add. To uh, I just wanted to add, um, in terms of being educated ourselves as, as far as the black community and on campus, I just want to shout out the Scarlet Chapter of NAACP. Um, Defari and his, and his uh, organization is doing a great job with education and talking about politics and policies. And I just wanted to give them that, that little bit of praise right there. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, brother. Uh, I, as, as you know, Brother Sam said, I'm the president of the Scarlet NAACP here at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Um, and it's really good to be recognized for the, the work that we've been doing. Um, and, you know, the Delta Iota chapter has been there stepping, you know, uh, stepping, I guess, step by step of the way um, as we've been trying to make sure that we educate the campus as best as we can. Um, so, again, anything else, brothers, about the election we want to talk about? All right. Um, so a little bit of devastating news that we saw coming out of Jamaica. Um, there's been massive floods that's happening that have been causing, you know, landslides that is displacing, you know, many people. Um, so our thoughts and prayers, first and foremost, go out to the, the citizens of Jamaica, our brothers and sisters out there. We're we are praying for you. Uh, you're in our thoughts. So do the brothers have, you know, any feelings toward that? Anything yeah, that um, just just like Brother Well said, um, please keep them in your prayers. If there's any initiatives that anybody wants to bring up, please let us know and we'll share and we'll support. Um, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. You, know, you feel me? So um, that's a big thing. Yeah. Um, and the one of the you know the most frustrating parts about when things like this happen is that we know Jamaica to be one of the largest tourist you know attractions in the world, but the people there are living in extreme poverty, um, and it's still considered to be a third world nation when you know you have people, Western civilization so to speak, come over there and spend millions of dollars a year, mm -hmm. similar to what we've seen you know with the Bahamas when they experienced their terrible hurricanes. Mm -hmm. You have all of these conglomerate or uh, organization, these capitalist structures that operate within these islands that just use it for the beauty. But when it comes to natural disasters that uh, affect the, the island, they, they don't come around Support. to help in a, yeah. you know, in a positive way, similar to with Puerto Rico. So I do want to take it upon ourselves and you know the black community, the Caribbean community, just the American community at large to recognize what's happening around the world, specifically right now what's going on in Jamaica, and do our best to you know help and aid in any way we can. So again, our thoughts and prayers are with the Jamaican people right now as they go through this terrible time. Um, moving a little bit forward into some more devastating news, um, a young man in Louisiana by the name of Kawan Charles was found murdered mm -hmm. um, in a lake. Um, you know, this is something you may have seen on uh, Instagram or whatever social media platform you use most frequently. Very, um, you know, traumatizing images, and some people brought up the connection to Emmett Till the young 14-year-old boy from Mississippi, or I apologize, from uh, Chicago, who was murdered in Mississippi um, back in the 60s. So, brothers, uh, how do we feel about this, you know, tragedy that's taking place in Louisiana? Well, it's, you know, it's a type of tragedy that we've seen far too often here in the black community. Um, it's very, you know, heart-wrenching to see this kind of treatment for someone that is a human being, someone that should be treated, you know, as an equal in a humane manner. But rather, we see this repeated occurrence of us black people being treated as less, being treated as, you know, less than one third of a man or probably like animals. And, mm -hmm. you know, to see someone who probably had a very promising future, someone that was going to be or was, you know, a positive contribution to the community, someone that had future potential to see them go like that. It's very, very disturbing, you know, and it, it, it makes my mind race because, for what reason would someone have an ending like that? Like, there's no, like, real reason. So, like, me as someone that wants to be, like, a future black father, someone that mm -hmm. is, you know, passionate about um, empowering the youth in their community, although you can take X, Y, Z steps to cultivate people in a positive manner, you'll have people of an opposing side 
trying to, you know, implement these type of bad outcomes on their life. It's like, what can we do as a black community to combat that, you know? Like, it's very terrible. It's it's very disheartening. But, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with his family and community. And, you know, I, I pray that, you know, us black people, although we've been suffering for so long, we see, you know, change in this because it's 2020. This is inexcusable. Right. right. You know, but... Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, it's difficult to see that happening in today's age. We expect change from years and decades and, and generations before us, but change has still not come. Um, so it's a matter of like just pushing forward. Um, we always have a target on our back, as, as especially as black men and black women in, in this country. Um, we're fighting for more than just to live. Well, fighting for more than just like you know normal lives. We're just fighting to live. Um, the target is very like stren- strenuous and stressful. So it was. I was really devastated to hear about it. Um, yeah, that's what I gotta yeah. say. Um, as the brothers just, you know, explained, very, very sentimental to see this happening. And I do want to propose a question to the brothers. You mm-hmm. know, why do we feel like, you know, we've been here? They say since 1619. They say that's when the first enslaved people um, from Angola were captured by uh, Portuguese pirates and then stolen by English settlers and you know brought to the colony of Jamestown, Virginia. So since 1619, um, we have been here. Uh, I think we've been here earlier, but that's neither here nor there. Mm. Um, so since 1619, we've been experiencing this similar, you know, struggle just to get not even equality, just equity, you know, and, you know, just to be seen as, as human. So why do we think it's taken this long, you know, for us to even get to where we're at now? I don't know. Some people say we progressed. I think it's only symbolically. But what do we think? Why do we think we've been dealing with this so for so long? Why do we think we had an Emmett Till in the 1960s and now we're dealing with a Kawan Charles in 2020? Great question, brother. So uh, to me, I believe it's because we didn't have no no say in the structure of this country. Um, we didn't have no rights to to speak up against what is happening or to to set up a plan, plan in place for all of us to be on the same page. And since we're, we weren't even considered, you know, human at the time. Right. Um, we have no rights in what is said, and since that has not changed and we have not broken down that system, um, that system will just continue to be in place, and the consequences will never affect those that need to be, you know, um, disciplined, essentially. Yeah, like, just to hop off on that, you know, or to continue off of that, I would say that, you know, although I love this country, you know, someone that is blessed to be gifted with the opportunities that America has, I will say that you know, if we're being real, the country was founded on corruption, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, corruption in many avenues, especially when it comes to human rights and, you know, just human interaction in general. Uh, When you see the reoccurrence of these type of events, you have to question, you have to like ask yourself, like, is this really, you know, what the founding fathers of this country Mm. were trying to cultivate? Mm. You know, maybe it's yes, maybe it's no, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's very, it's very disheartening because, we're fed these, you know, notions of, you know, land of the free, right. um, you know, like home of the brave. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, we as black people have been dealt with by cowards, not brave people. Mm-hmm. People that stand behind a, you know, a notion that they don't follow. Mm-hmm. They don't follow their speech. They talk, but they don't walk the walk, you know. So it's very disappointing. And us as black people... We can only, you know, search for more knowledge, better guidance, and, you know, have that implemented in our lives moving forward. And hopefully, you know, we can see change gradually. But, it, you know, the systems that have been um, established are very systematic. And, like, you know, I'm not going to say they're permanent because change will come eventually, right. you know, because I'm hopeful. But, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, no, I agree um, 100%, brother. So, no, I want to touch on a point that you made briefly about, you know, the guys or the the premonition that they they claim that this is, you know, some, you know, all men are created equal. I think the, the great uh, Reverend Brother Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, um, America, we've come here to cash a check on the 1963 March on Washington. He said, we come here to cash a check. Well, America has uh, given us a, a blank check, a bad check, a check that has come back with insufficient funds. Mm. And what he meant by that was that America, as you know, Brother Sano just said, has a lot of great ideals, a lot of great founding principles, so to speak. But, you know, the the population that has been here arguably the longest, or at least the second longest, um, have never been able to fully 
um, become ingrained in that type of culture where we feel like we're actually free. Right. Um, you know, if you just look at the statistics of the education opportunities, you look at the statistics when it comes to the prison population, you look at the statistics um, for impoverished people, you know, nine times out of ten, every bad category is going to skew toward black people mm -hmm. being more um, within that category. So uh, I'll ask my next question. Um, what do we think as alphas, you know, we, we have a, a long a long legacy of, of great brothers from, you know, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Jesse Owens, again, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, Dick Gregory, so many, uh, W.B. Du Bois, just to name a few. Um, what do we think in 2020 as us, as black men, as brothers of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, what do we think that we can do to ensure that the future looks the way we want it to look? Um, to me, essentially, um, one of the reasons why I became a brother um, is to basically infiltrate the system and break it down from within um, and bring my people up while I'm doing it. Um, so I really feel like um, when, I, when I become a professional and I get into that field and I, I get in the, the realms of, of what other people are doing, I can definitely come, come back to my community from where I was raised and where I grew up and, and bring those up and see see the young people in that community grow up to be you know better than I am because I'm I'm one step and I want them to step up um, as generations go on and as the, as that time goes on we'll progress and our foundation will be stronger and we'll just keep going up so that's one of the main things um, I believe we can do. Yeah, I agree with Brother Jamar. You know, um, some of our ancestors, you know, walked so we could run. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can parallel that to today's world you know as he said entering the professional world you really if you're black you know and one thing i'm noticing like me for example i'm pre-med right as i progress in my education it's very common for faces like me to be uncommon in the classroom mm. uh, it's it's very you know and it's very loud like it's it's not it's not something i just <laughs> ignore mm. like before i used to you know have like other people look like me we'll, we'll be taking a class but then now it's like you know i'm, I'm currently on a grad program I'm like wow like like yes. hey john <laughs> like you look like me but what's up like but you know i feel like it's imperative uh, upon us black people that are fortunate enough to be advancing in our educational levels which will hopefully translate to better jobs better positions in certain fields it's it's a given mm -hmm. that we have to extend our hand to those that are below us mm -hmm. to bring them to our level because as as we've said before you know we are not common in those higher places right. and those higher places are being occupied by a majority white or asian faces right so them having that position you know they're comfortable there why would they give the position to black people mm -hmm. to advance because right. it's right no. <laughs> so whichever one of us has the opportunity to get there, it's imperative that, you know, we extend that hand and lift as we climb because we're, mm. we're, we're all we got, mm. you know, at the end of the day. All right. So uh, just moving a little bit forward, we're going to take it a little bit lighter because we can't, you know, um, have a talk like this without, yeah, without, without having, um, you know, of course, we're going to make it a little bit lighter. We can't have a conversation uh, like this without talking about serious issues. We're going to bring it over to the sports arena a little bit. Um, talks of James Harden potentially wanting out of Houston. How you feel about that, Brother Sinan? Listen, man, you know, you know, as they say, fear the beard. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, James Harden wanting out of Houston. It's, I, I, I don't blame him. You know, that man mm -hmm. is nice with it. You know, <laughs> like he, he makes me want to be left-handed, you know, <laughs> but for real. Nah, but um, James Harden, heck of a player. Um, I'm hearing that um, him making a move to Brooklyn is something mm -hmm. in the works. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds great. That sounds great for like, you know, y'all that play 2K. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> right, right. But the reality of it, I'm very concerned. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you see the Brooklyn Nets, God bless them, you know, but they got, they have Kyrie and KD, you know, leading the team right now. And the thing is, when you add someone like James Harden to the mix, um, what is apparent to me is that you have three stellar players, but right. no, none of them are great leaders. Right. You know, KD is a walking bucket. Kyrie, walking bucket, 0.5. James Harden, walking bucket, 0.75, you know. <laughs> but when you put them together, I, my only concern is, you know, 
the the role of characters and personalities in the locker room and on the court mm-hmm. you know because not everybody could be alpha there you know no pun intended <laughs> but you know yeah i'm just hoping that um he lands in um a system that can properly allow him to you know get as far as he should you know i feel like he should be a champion by now mm-hmm. with his skill set you'd mm-hmm. think so but perhaps he hasn't been in the proper team or setting to do so. Um, although he has his qualms, he's a heck of a player. So I'm hoping that he lands where he's best utilized. Yeah, I, I agree on that point. I feel like him going to Brooklyn might be counterintuitive in the sense that, like, they're superstars will kind of, like, butt heads too much. Like, everybody wants attention because they're used to getting attention. But when it comes down to it, um, one or more of them is going to have to take a step back. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. And, like... And and develop leadership and at some point in order or order for them to prosper. If they don't develop leadership, if one of them doesn't become the leader that they need to be for the team, they're never gonna work out. No matter how good individually they are, they're just ultimately never going to succeed, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I agree a hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like, you know, in this instance, oh my bad. Yeah, yeah in this instance, I agree a hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? In this instance, you know, like. I just don't know. Like, Kyrie, he a Jersey boy. That's my guy. The greatest ball handler we've ever seen. Par none, well, bar none, rather. Um, he's just, he can't be a third option. Mm-hmm. If you have Kevin Durant and James Harden mm-hmm. on your team. <laughs> you were you're third, a third option. <laughs> you're, a third option. <laughs> you're a third option. There's no way you're getting it. And then James Harden, if, if I'm not mistaken, him and Russell Westbrook for the last seven years, had the highest percentage of the ball in their hand. Like, and I think Russell Westbrook was at like 36. James Harden was at like 38% of the time he had the ball in his mm. hand. Um, it's going to be hard to fit that into a system with KD, who's coming off a major Achilles injury. Right. He's going to have to get his touches to get in his rhythm. You know what I'm saying? Kyrie, he, we, he's Kyrie. He's not going to be able to average 25 like he wants to. Right. If you have, the, you have two of the greatest scorers of all time, like literally Kevin Durant and James Harden. Are two of the greatest scorers, if not top five all time, like mm. pure scorers. So I, I mean, Kyrie is not a true point guard. Like so, it's like all he really not. And this is I love you, Kyrie from New Jersey. I've <laughs> seen you see play. this. <laughs> I mean, no disrespect. You're not a facilitator. Like you're not a James, You're not a, a Chris Paul. You're not a, a you know Rondo. Even like a I mean James Harden, in my opinion, can facilitate better than Kyrie has. Kyrie, James Harden had. Average ten assists a game, like twice, if I'm mm. not mistaken. Yeah, uh, he led the league in assists one year. So it's just like I don't know. It's like a bunch. Of, you want to have to bring a point guard into that system for it to work. But then it's like, where did that really? And how you gonna pay all of them? You know what I'm saying? Like James Harden contract is exorbitant right now. I know it might be like dwindling or going off, but he got one of them two hundred twenty million dollar contracts mm-hmm. too. So it's like, how are you gonna pay all of them? I don't see how that will work. It sounds great on paper. But like logistically, I just don't see it happening. I don't see them being able to pull off the trade first and foremost, um, and then secondly, I don't see them winning a chip. Do they make it out the East? Definitely. Mm-hmm. There's no way you're not going to the Eastern Conference Finals without with Kyrie, KD, and James Harden. Um, but I just don't know if that'll get over LeBron and them because you know LeBron going back to back, back to back. LeBron um, head. You know what I'm saying? It'd be like that. It'd definitely yeah. be like that. Definitely be like that. Um, so over the weekend, uh, this will be our last story. Over the weekend, we saw the Rutgers football team take another unfortunate loss uh, to uh, fighting the Illini to Illinois. Um, you know, it was 20 to, 23 to 20, um, you know, Illinois winning. But we won our first game of the season with, uh, uh, versus Michigan State. That was a huge accomplishment for us. So how do we feel about the, you know, Greg Schiano signing um, and the progress of the Rutgers football team over these past couple of years? Well, you know what? We're moving in the right direction, and that's what I like to see. Um, We were the worst team in the Big Ten, Um, (laughs) so it's good to see us moving forward. Um, The game was very close um, this past weekend, and so, you know, we have potential, and that's that's all I can ask for. Um, In the years to come, we'll we'll get better and better with the Greg Schiano era, Mm -hmm. so that's all I wanted to see was progress. Yeah. Very quickly, uh, Penn State is 0-3. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and three. <laughs> 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 you love to see it. 
<laughs> all right. Um, so I think, you know, unless unless we have anything else to say, thank you all so much. Wait, for one, one last thing to yeah, say. Yeah, please, um, please. We definitely wanted to bring up our... We definitely wanted to bring up our Founders Day, December 4th. Um, we were founded the uh, Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, and as it does say with the chapter, we want you to be aware of Alpha Week. And um, we will have some great programs going on um, during that week. So please stay on the lookout for that. Stay in tune. You'll see our lovely faces again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just please be aware for that. Anything you'd like to mention, Brother Sino? No, I see. All right. Uh, as Brother Sino just said, Alpha Week uh, will be taking place the first week of December. Yep. Mm -hmm. First week of December. Um, also, as he said, we were founded. Our uh, fraternity was founded December 4th, 1906, on the campus of Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. Talk your seven. talk. You know, the seven jewels, as we like talk to call them, talk. the seven distinguished men. Um, and we will be celebrating the legacy of the Delta Iota chapter as well as the chapter at large, I mean, of the fraternity at large. Definitely. So with that being said, thank you so much for sitting around and listening to us talk. We are the Delta Iota chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Again, my name is Jafari Wells. My name is Umar Sano. And my name is Jamar Sims. And we would like to give a lovely shout out to my guy, my tail, my six. Basiyama Ibanga, you know, he got the setup looking real great, you know. Shout out to the director, DI for director. You already know. <laughs> this man do it all. He yes, does sir. it all. All right, y'all. Until next time, peace. All right, y'all. Stay blessed.